Today we'll be covering some seemingly innocent images that contain a much darker backstory than you'd think. From one of the oddest cases I've ever seen, to one you may know all too well, welcome to the first, and probably not last, episode of Morbid Reality. These are all posts from the Morbid Reality or Unchained Melancholy subreddit, and they'll all be linked below along with my Twitter as always. Without further ado, let's get into it. This is a common image that we know all too well from social media. A new family documenting their happiness as they take on the challenges of their firstborn. Here we see a husband, a wife, their child, and who seems to be their grandmother. So, what happened to the people in this image? Well, the man on the far right is named Blake Libel. Libel, born in 1981 in Toronto, Ontario, to parents Lorne and Eleanor Libel, was a comic book writer, screenwriter, and graphic novelist. One of his most notable works is Spaceballs, the animated series. In around 2004, he met the woman in the photo, Yana Kashian. She was born in Kiev, Ukraine in 1986, making her five years his junior. She was a prosecutor in Kiev until she moved to the US in 2014 and worked as a model in California. Now onto what happened to these people. Over the course of their relationship, they had a child as you'd seen in the photo from earlier. Of course, a newborn baby requires a lot of attention, and Yana was a good mother and made sure to take the time required to care for the newborn properly. Blake didn't like that. He wanted more control over her and her attention and the baby was taking away from that. It's reported that he was so controlling in fact that even though Yana's mother had come all the way from the Ukraine to see the birth of the new baby, he wouldn't allow her to come see it. The rage from his lack of control began to consume him and soon he decided to take it out on her. In a more than extremely graphic series of events, he ended Yana's life. Eerily enough, this whole event was very similar to his graphic novel Syndrome, which is thought to be the blueprint for the entire situation. Most people have had to get their picture taken at school before. The same goes for this boy in this middle school photo. You may ask what makes this photo so disturbing. Well, this is a photo of Song Hui Cho. Born in 1984 in Asan, South Korea, Cho was always quiet and rarely showed emotion, something that caused his family concern. During elementary school, Cho would commonly throw fits after he got home, telling his parents he never wanted to go back to school again. Years later, in middle school, Cho was finally diagnosed with selective mutism a social anxiety disorder that causes one to not be able to speak in specific circumstances or to specific individuals. Throughout middle and high school, he would go through different types of speech classes and mental health therapy. Of course, this led to inevitable bullying in high school and he was pretty much a loner. During his ninth grade year, the infamous aired on television. This transfixed Cho and he idolized the perpetrators. He even wrote a school assignment about wanting to repeat the event. This caused him to be sent to a psychiatrist, which must not have done much good. Eventually in 2003, Cho would begin to attend Virginia Tech. Cho's poetry professor claimed that his behavior was menacing and that his writing was intimidating. He had odd interactions with other students, like calling them and introducing himself under the name question mark, and getting in trouble for harassing female students multiple times. At this point, anyone who had tried to befriend Cho now had slowly stopped talking to him due to his behavior, and as always, he was alone with his own thoughts. These thoughts could only lead to disaster. On April 16, 2007, Cho would commit one of the worst mass shootings in US history. He ended the lives of 32 people that day with only two semi-automatic pistols. He also ended his own life that day. This image is of Romicha Sims and her son Jair Lee. On May 20th, 2015, they visited Wills Memorial Park in Maryland as people often do with their children. It started off normally with Romicha simply pushing Jair on the swing. But as time passed, she kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Minutes turned to hours, and hours turned to days. 43 and a half hours, or nearly two days after they had arrived, Romisha was found still pushing her son on the same swing, although at this point he was no longer alive. He had passed on due to dehydration and hypothermia, but she hadn't stopped pushing him. Romicha's family stated that she suffers from depression and bipolar disorder. They claim it's more than likely she had an episode, and that this has happened before. She was later ruled as schizophrenic but not dangerous, and was able to plead to a lesser charge. She was under specific conditions like taking medication and seeing a psychiatrist over her five-year conditional release. She claims she heard voices when pushing him on the swing that told her to not stop because somebody would come. This is an image of Pavel Kashin, a parkour enthusiast from St. Petersburg, Russia. In this image from 2013, he's seen performing a backflip off the roof of a 16-story building as another person films him. Just seconds after this photo, Kashin would lose his footing and would fall 200 feet. He would not survive. Kashin's parents believed that this would serve as a warning to other practitioners of parkour and freerunning and that they shouldn't take the risks too lightly. 
This is an image of the YouTuber Apator. Real name Tor Ekoff, Apator was a beloved Norwegian YouTuber with over 1 million subscribers. On his channel, he would document his adventures doing all types of different things around Norway and occasionally around the world. This image is more specifically from a video titled, I am not dead, I'm 57 today. Five days later, Apator would be filming a video doing a common son of his, that being walking on thin ice. As he walked along the Jacobs Dam in Kongsberg, the ice cracked and pulled him in. He would eventually be found and hospitalized, however he would pass away the next day. This is an image of 25-year-old Larry Murillo Moncada. On November 26, 2009, he worked a relatively normal shift at the No Frills supermarket. When he returned home, he seemed disoriented and was acting unusual. This caused his family to take him to a doctor, which prescribed him antidepressant medication. This didn't work, and things continued to get worse. Murillo Moncada would commonly hear voices. For example, the voices would tell him to eat sugar because it would stop his heart from beating so fast. On November 28th, he claimed that someone was following him and that he was scared. This led to him running out into a snowstorm with no socks or shoes on, no cell phone, and no car keys. His parents filed a missing persons report and his mother was convinced that he had gone to the No Frills grocery store. After checking the store and calling family and friends, nothing would turn up. Eventually in 2016, the supermarket would close for business and in 2019 they would begin to clean it out and tear it down. This is when they discovered a behind the cooler unit in an employees only area. After DNA testing, it was confirmed to be Murillo Moncada. It's believed that he climbed on top of the cooler unit, but fell 12 feet down behind it and due to how loud it was, nobody ever found him. Of course, this would disregard the fact that eventually there would be some sort of strong odor due to decomposition, so there may be more to this one than meets the eye. In Humble, Texas, a 24-year-old man was heading into a Chuck E. Cheese in Humble to celebrate his daughter's sixth birthday when he was shot in the parking lot and later died. The victim's wife identified him as Caloguero Duenes. Amber Oresti said she and her six and three-year-old daughters had gone inside the restaurant before her husband, who was tasked with getting the cake. I saw him, Oresti said. I saw him walking towards us. I told the lady my husband was on his way. I pointed at him, and the instant I turned around, he came running in through the door and kept saying, I got shot. Humble police obtained surveillance video they said showed Duenas encounter with the shot. Police said the suspect drove the wrong way down a row of parking spaces and almost hit the victim. The video then shows the two exchange words. Moments later, a witness told the police they heard three gunshots. He picked up his shirt and ran outside, Oresti said. I ran out after him. My six-year-old saw him fall on the ground. Duenas was taken to the hospital where he died a short time later. He had no weapons, Oresti said. He was holding my daughter's birthday cake. He had nothing on him. I don't understand why. Oresti said she and Duenas were set to celebrate their 10th anniversary in September. We grew up together, she said. Every day for the last 10 years, it's been me and him. I really don't know what I'm going to do anymore. It's really hard. My daughter has been crying, Oresti said. She slept last night with her father's shirt, crying until she fell asleep, and it breaks my heart. There's nothing I can tell her. There's no words to tell her other than, Daddy's with you in your heart. He loves you. Police said the perpetrator has not been caught, but there is an ongoing investigation. The suspect is believed to be driving a black Ford car. It was the morning of May 5, 1979 when the scanner in the newsroom of the Birmingham News began squawking reports from motorists that they had seen a hand sticking from the trunk of a car. Mark Wynn, an intern reporter, and veteran photographer Jerry Ayers set out to see if they could solve the mystery. After a while, and just as the two had already given up hope of finding it, Wynn spotted the beat-up beige Dodge traveling northbound on Interstate 2059 in Inslee. Wynn was in the front passenger seat and Ayers was driving. They followed the Dodge through the traffic moving northeast bound on the interstate. At one point, Wynn takes the wheel so Ayers can snap some photos of the Dodge and the hand sticking out through a crevice in the trunk. The Dodge exited at the airport boulevard off-ramp as the driver of the Dodge, a woman, apparently realized they were being followed. The driver then began weaving through a neighborhood. All the while, Wynn used their radio to tell their ever-changing location to on-duty editor Garland Reeves, who relayed the information to a Birmingham police dispatcher. Police stopped the car and arrested three people, Joseph Fenley, 27, of Morris, his uncle Wilburn Fenley, 49, of Bessemer, and the driver, Robin Green, 24, of Birmingham. They also freed Collier from the trunk. Collier said that he had met the three at a bar in Bessemer the night before. He said he was robbed of 350 from a disability check, was beaten, and stabbed with a screwdriver, 
and forced into the trunk. As the three were driving around and he tried to fight to stay awake from the carbon monoxide, Collier said that he was able to slip his hand through a gap in the rubber seal at the lip of the trunk and wave to motorists. During the 14 hours he was in the truck, Collier said he could hear people inside the car talking about where to dump his body. I done made my peace, Collier told Wynn at the time, or was trying to. After his rescue from the trunk, Collier thanked Wynn and Ayers. Charges against Wilbur and Finley were dismissed by a judge who found out that he had joined the other two after the robbery had occurred and after Collier had already been put in the trunk. Court records, however, do not show what happened to the charges against Joseph Finley and Robin Green. Well, I'm not sure if you could really enjoy that, but I hope you were educated or something like that regardless. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more creepy content. Thank you for watching as always, and have a good day.